All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am beyond excited to welcome to the stage the composer of Knives Out 2, Mr. Nathan Johnson, all the way from Los Angeles. Please welcome him. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to go back to the beginning of your relationship with Ryan, because you're obviously cousins and you grew up making movies together ever since very, very young age. So can you talk just a little bit about how your relationship has evolved and what your collaborative process is like with Brian? Yeah, totally. Well, and first of all, thank you guys all for coming out and watching this and, and staying here, and thanks for, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, we, uh, we basically grew up making movies and music together ever since we were little kids. We've got a giant family, and so we would rope all the younger cousins into being our unpaid labor. And, <laughs> Being, being our actors and um, yeah, and then we would kind of at the end of every sort of vacation, we would gather all the adults into my grandparents' basement and show them the, the newest movie we had made. Um, and then we just kept doing it. <laughs> right. So what's it like? I mean, you're, clear, you're working on a massive Hollywood scale at this point, but you're still those same, it's still the same relationship that you have when you were making movies for $200. What's it like having that relationship evolve and having you and Ryan both as artists evolve? What's it like at this point looking back and reflecting on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. It's uh, because we have kind of this shared language and we, you know, we very much know what we're talking about just that, uh, you know, if he gives me an early reference, I kind of know what direction he's going in. Um, but the thing that I love about it is, you know, usually a composer is brought in kind of, you know, pretty much right at the end of the whole process um, when the whole movie is already shot and edited. And, um, and when I'm working with Ryan, it, it starts basically at writing stage. So he'll send me the script and then very early we're talking about kind of broad strokes, what it's gonna be. And, um, and then I get to go on set and I'll bring, you know, a little portable writing rig and, and while they're making the movie, I get to observe and, and see, kind of see the tone developing and, and I'll just be sketching ideas. And um, so it's, it's really, for a composer, it's a really luxurious process to kind of get to come on board that early and, um, and, and just develop it together. Right, and it's worthy to note that the score that you produced, Nightmare Alley for Guillermo del Toro, you wrote that score in four weeks. So just to compare the scale of something like Knives Out, where you had months and months to write music, on that film you had weeks. So you've clearly worked in both arenas. Yeah, you, I mean, I consider myself a slow writer, so when, when I had four weeks to do it, I wasn't even sure if it was possible. But, um, but yeah, th this is getting to go to Greece and and write for a whole summer in Greece is uh, do that if you can do that. <laughs> right. And you've been doing that with Ryan forever on Looper. You traveled to set and recorded sounds and actually created the percussion and the score through the sounds that you recorded on set. Yeah, not even just the percussion, but most of the Looper score was, was made from field recordings. So like treadmills and running water. And I, I basically processed all of that and, and created you know, the, essentially like an industrial sounding, uh, you know, DIY orchestra. Um, and yeah, and then for this, we, we obviously got to use some of the best players in the world, so. Uh, but I'm curious, that original film had such a sharp, very small score in terms of having a string quartet. And with this film, you're expanding it. You have a massive orchestra, this big, beautiful, opulent sound. So can you talk about what your approach was for writing this score coming off of Knives Out and how you wanted to make it different and what you wanted to keep and what you wanted to write that was new? Yeah, well, early on, Ryan said, with, with this, we want to lean into the fun. Um, and we want to lean into that opulent, sort of romantic European, you know, melodic score. Um, one of the one of the sort of our touch points for Knives Out was we talked about wanting to hear every single thing in the orchestra uh, as opposed to kind of like an ambient wash of sound. We wanted we wanted you to be able to hear every single player in that score. And so for this, we kind of we kind of kept that same approach, but um, but it was almost like I wrote 
sort of with a string quartet approach, but for, for the whole orchestra. Um, so he, I think I think that's something now, I mean, this is now only the second one that we've done, but I think that that's something that will mark these movies is the idea of precise, um, specific scores that are really driven by character motifs and themes. Um, it's kind of, it's like these are the scores that Ryan and I grew up loving, um, which, which kind of in a way melodic theme driven scores have kind of fallen out of vogue in, in the last 10 to 20 years. But, um, but thank God that Ryan is a fan of those because it's, it's, it's what I love doing and the ability to kind of expand the, the palette and use a giant orchestra, but still write and record the orchestra in a very precise way so that it doesn't feel like a wash of sound, but we're still able to track all those themes through it is, um, yeah, it's just a really rewarding way to approach it. Right, absolutely. And I love the colors that you chose to use in this score. Specifically, I'm talking about a harpsichord. What was your idea in terms of bringing in the harpsichord and also the amazing harp player that you worked with on this film? Yeah, so again, that's sort of a way to anchor it in a very precise... I mean, harpsichord is like the most precise instrument. Um, and uh, I think I, that was actually something that Ryan sort of brought up to me. And, and I think it was... I think in his mind, it was very much linked to the old murder mysteries. Um, but it's kind of interesting because I, it's one of the things I love about Ryan is he tends to zig when you expect him to zag. But obviously in the way that he writes and approaches genres, but, um, but very much so in the, in the realm of music. I think for the first Knives Out, it's a manor house mystery. It's, it's kind of this New England sort of small mystery and you kind of expect harpsichord would make sense for that but um but yeah he, he, we there's no harpsichord in the first one and we kind of waited till we went to this big like grecian explosive over the top modern house um to to use harpsichord to invite us into the movie um yeah and from what i understand your wife might wish that you have used a less harsh dynamic instrument when writing music in that in oh, the man. studio? So I did, so this and then the the thing that I just finished, um, Ryan wrote a TV show for Natasha Leone called Poker Face and that is a banjo score. So it's like if you could if you could find two instruments to annoy your spouse with, it would be harpsichord and banjo. Um. <laughs> I love it. So in terms of the thematic material, every single film especially when we're talking about the golden age of cinema, which Ryan is super influenced by and this film is so influenced by, thematic material is such an important part. And we obviously know composers like John Williams have used thematic material to create the scores, but I love that you chose to use themes. And specifically, there's two themes in this film that I love, and one of them is Andy's theme, which is carried through the entire movie. And the next one is that sort of main title theme that plays when we first cut to the drone shot going over Greece and it's throughout the film. So talk about creating those two themes and what you wanted to, uh, how you wanted to use the themes throughout the movie. Yeah, the, so the first, the main theme from Knives Out, sort of our big epic, um, you know, romantic 70s European approach, um, that was something that Ryan and I were talking about. We were actually talking about Nino Rota's score for the original Death on the Nile. Um, but I was also listening to a bunch of like 60s and 70s French pop music and, you know, there are these very like slippery strings and there's, it's sort of, um, you know, I didn't, I, I kind of very specifically didn't want to do Grecian music because I honestly don't know if Miles knows that he's in Greece, you know, like nothing, nothing about that is important to him. So it's, it's more, I think the, my doorway into it was almost this idea of like what do what do Americans what do we what do I think of when I think of like this lush old school European romantic sound um, and that that was you know that involved like a massive string section in the orchestra um, with with like tons of vibrato which is kind of never like I I almost never write with vibrato for strings but for this it just it just soaked it up and when I when I kind of cracked that theme, it became very clear that, okay, this is, you know, Ryan's eyes lit up and it was like, okay, this is what the movie is gonna sound like. Um, yeah, so that was, I think that was uh, the first theme that I cracked. But then for Andy's theme, 
it's, I mean, first of all, Janelle Monet just, yeah, she, her performance was so amazing. And I knew that we needed, um, for her theme, it, it almost has to be, um, there has to be a power there, but there has to be a vulnerability at the same time. There has to be a romanticism, but there also has to be pain. There, the, it, it kind of has to um, continue to be interpreted in different ways from the first time we introduce it, right when she gets the puzzle box at the beginning up to the very last scene when, when she's looking around uh, the room asking for the people to raise their hand. Um, and the, I, I should also just say, you know, a lot of times directors turn to their composer when a scene's not working and they're like, Hey, you know, we didn't, we didn't really get this. Can you, can you get us across the line here? Can you help, can you help fix this? Cause the audience isn't feeling what we want them to be feeling here. Um, and with Ryan's movies that just doesn't happen. Like it's, he's such a good writer. And then to have an all-star cast like this kind of giving the performances of their, of their lives, it, in a way it makes my job pretty easy because I'm, I'm not trying to fix anything. I just get to come in and kind of dance with the characters and, and, and sort of support what they're doing. But I think that's one of the most fascinating parts of this movie and especially coming from the perspective of a film composer, I loved the way that you danced in the film. And there's one particular scene when Daniel Craig and Janelle Monet's character are on a balcony in the city. And it's like a 10 minute scene of them talking. And if you look at a scene without music of two people talking, you think to yourself, how am I gonna score this? And your, your score is so dynamic throughout the movie and it constantly like leads the audience on this roller coaster ride. Um, so how in a mystery kind of movie where there's so many plot uh, points that are sort of, um, you know, traversing to that final conclusion. How do you as a composer guide uh, the audience through that uh, journey? Thankfully, I think what your job as a composer is, if I, or at least what it is to me, is to track the emotional crux of the scene. Um, so so I, I, uh, I tend to to think less uh, like of a mastermind approach like that and and much more working really closely with Ryan and saying what's going on in the scene what do we need to be feeling and and also what are what are the characters feeling what are they telegraphing how are they changing from beginning to end but um but Ryan talks about these movies as he, he it's and I think this is really smart he says his approach is not to make a crossword puzzle um, it's to make a roller coaster ride, Be you know, it, and it's like, okay, it's a murder mystery, and to some degree, we come in thinking like, okay, who who did it? Who who am I thinking? I think that's a really boring way to watch a movie. And one of the things that I think Ryan brilliantly does is he very quickly gives us some things, so we stop thinking about that, and we just get to follow these characters on a ride. So, you know, as a murder mystery, like. For the beginning of this, the first statement is like, we want to say, hey, welcome. We're, this is going to be a fun time. Let's go to Greece. And then obviously there are all the tense moments, but I think, um, I think maybe something that, that it took me a minute to realize was if we don't care about the characters, specifically Andy, then it all falls apart. So it's... Um, Aside from any cleverness, and the you know, and Ryan writes with tons of cleverness, but but really, you can sort of put all that to the side because it, because if it doesn't work at that at that core level, and if we don't care about the characters, and if we're not invested in in their pain and in wanting to see them win, then then it doesn't work. So I I kind of feel like my job as a composer is mostly to track that. But there are very specific instances. For example, there's a scene in the film, and we'll put a spoiler alert on this, but where a certain theme might have been stolen from one of our central characters. So little things like that that sort of weave into the narrative and help connect the audience to that. Yeah, it's, um, it, so that's something that I, I first played around with on our Ryan and uh, his very first movie, Brick, that I scored um, was this idea of theme stealing. And when you have a thematic based score where, where different characters have their own motifs, it 
kind of opens up some really unique possibilities because generally I'm tracking those motifs with the characters through the movie. But there's a scene where um, where Blanc and Miles are up in the glass onion and Miles is looking at the photo of of the disruptors in the bar and he's saying, man, I miss that bar. And he's kind of, he's kind of spinning a story to Blanc. Um, and when I, when I started scoring that, I, I brought Ryan over and I was like, what if, what if Miles steals Andy's theme here? And he kind of cackled with delight. Um, because it's like, you know, this is like this thing about, and it's something Edward Norton said, like the way he thought about this character is that Miles has never had an original thought in his life. And, um, and so I think again, but that's again, from a story perspective, it's, he's, he's like spinning this story to Blanc at this moment. And, um, and like he stole Alpha, the company from Andy, he, he taps into Andy's theme and you hear her theme playing as, as he's kind of spinning this tale. So, um, you know, and this, obviously this is not something that I expect anyone to catch on a first or second listen, but but there is something there when you when you attach these motifs to characters or to feelings to have another character kind of tap into that and steal that. Um, th I think that's in a way for me that's a, a sort of doorway to understand again what their motivations are and how they're playing with each other through the movie. I love that because I always think about the score for the movie Inception and how the main theme is basically that song that's used throughout the movie, but just slow down. And I would never notice it, the audience would never notice it, but it's the subconscious thing that seeps its way in. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the experience was like recording the score? Because you worked with some of the best, literally some of the best musicians on the planet in London at Abbey Road Studios. We actually took, we, actually what we just did is we just took the song Glass Onion and we slowed it down. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, no, it was amazing. We so we did the first Knives Out at Abbey Road, and that was the first time I had gotten to work there, which was just amazing. And and for this, we kind of got to go go back and uh, do it again with a, a bigger group this time. But um, same string quartet from the first movie, and I wrote I wrote a new quartet for them to play uh, during the glass smashing scene. Um, but yeah, there's there's nothing like also this was the first movie since since COVID sort of shut everything down where we got to go back and record uh, with everyone in the same room together. So, um, you know, before we had been striping things and having people record separately, but it was really, there's there's kind of nothing like um, getting 70 of, of your closest friends into a room and um, yeah, having them, having them play the score live is just so, so, yeah, there's nothing like it. I'm really curious because I hear so many different composers talk about the power of film music. And I think especially in our world today where there's so many movies being made and there's so much music in movies, I'm so interested in your perspective on the power of music in film and specifically why you feel like it's something that you want to do, you want to be a part of. What is it about music in cinema that has played such an important part in your life? I mean, I think I... Uh, that's a great question. I think that I think about it as a, as a storytelling tool, and it's it's one of the things because I didn't grow up as a film composer. I grew up making movies and writing music kind of separately. Um, but it's but it's something um, just just in terms of this really magical tool to tell stories. For me, I often find that. Um, you know, there, there's that classic saying of uh, about truth in fiction, and and um, I, I love the difference between you know somebody stumping on a speech, kind of telling you the way the world is, that doesn't tend to to resound. I think, but there's just something about how we're wired in our culture that um, that when you see a story about something, there's like this empathetic, um, voyeuristic thing where you're you're looking in on someone else's life and you're able to draw all these parallels that maybe the authors don't even intend um and then i think to add music into that which is even more nebulous and unexplainable you know it's it's um music is something even between ryan and me that when we're when we're talking about it it's just hard to talk about and you kind of you kind of have to just make it and then 
say, okay, does that work or not? And, and often when I'm working, I'll, I'll just like write and put it up against the screen. Um, and uh, Guillermo del Toro actually said this really interesting thing about um, when, when he was making Nightmare Alley, he took a piece of my music and put it up against the movie and he said um, that, that the movie just drank it up. And that's, that's like a, such a nice poetic way of describing um, what I've what I've kind of been doing my whole career, but not not having those words to describe. But it really is like you'd kind of just write and put it up against picture and see does it does it drink it up and does it does it feel like it weirdly fits somehow. And by the way, Night Morale, his music for Night Morale. If anyone has not seen that film, it is a unbelievable score uh, that is just pure noir and pure cinema. So. Your music is phenomenal, the film is phenomenal, and congratulations on your work. I'd love to take some questions from the audience, if, if anyone has some questions for Nathan uh, in the audience. Thank you for being here, and uh, fantastic score, beautiful. Uh, love the, the, the old school. Um, I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot lately about, you used the word ambient at one point in your comments, and I've been thinking about this idea of an ambiance score as distinguished from an incidental score or the kind of thematic score that you're talking about. I'm thinking about Brian Eno when it comes to his, his stuff. And I'm wondering how you um, and your partners make a decision as to whether it's going to be one or the other or some combination of that. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think um, I think it just tends to be a conversation early on with the director and myself. And I, I don't know that we ever necessarily break it down so specifically, but for instance, with Looper, we talked about that. Um, at the beginning of Looper, Ryan uh, said, what if, what if the whole score is one chord? And I was, I was like, Oh wait, re wait, what? Really? You, like he—he he was like super into Wagner and the the opening of the Ring cycle. And he's like, what if we do the whole score as one chord? And he's like, or 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 what if we go into a into a, a studio and push televisions off the roof and like record that? And so like immediately, I was I was like, okay, that's that's like the mindset that he's in for this. And Looper hardly had any melody in it it was it was like field recordings and there were there were like mel melodic and harmonic elements but very open and very percussive um whereas for this you know it, it, when you're referencing Nino Rota's score for Death on the Nile or Maurice Jarre's work it's it's that it's that classic golden age of film scoring where where the themes are just like right out front um so I think I think Really, it, it all has to do with how do you how do you kind of what what is the movie I, again what what is gonna what is gonna drink up the music and um, I think I usually intuit that from the director rather than speaking about it quite so specifically. Uh, the Philip Glass reference did, does he actually get credit for something that you wrote? Was that your? No, that was actually. Um, I don't know if you saw in the credits, but that's Joseph Gordon-Levitt as the hourly dong. So um, that, yeah, and uh, and our music editor Joe Bond uh, kind of took his voice and uh, kind of put that that dong together. So I had nothing to do with it, but um, but yeah, J Joe Joe is the hourly dong, Got and it. forever will be. And my, my, my other question... I feel like we need to release that ringtone, right? I, could, <laughs> I, I sure. feel like that would, we would sell loads of that for people's phone. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, and my other question was, in the beginning, uh, there's a mention, Yo-Yo Ma talks about a fugue, um, and it kind of struck me that the sort of the structure of the movie a little bit is a fugue with this kind of return and retelling of the movie. It sounds like Ryan is really interested and hands-on and knowledgeable about music, but I had to assume that you also maybe had a, a hand in that or a suggestion or an observation that that was sort of a structure and similar to the first movie as well in terms of how it was structured. Yeah, that the Fugue whole approach is all Ryan, and he actually gave me a heads up um, early on while he was writing, but, but you're right, and great observation the movie is completely structured as a Fugue down to the, down to the point where um, 
you know, the box fugue plays the opening of the movie and when we reset, we hear it playing again and, and it's essentially the whole second half of the movie is like the second part of the melody being laid on top of and creating, the way Yo-Yo Ma says it is it creates a whole new, a whole new beautiful theme or something like that. But um, yeah, but that that is inherent to the structure of the movie and it's something that um, Ryan knew he wanted to use box Little Fugue uh, at, you know, from, from the very beginning. So that was all at the writing stage. Uh, hi, my name's Kayla. Thank you so much for being here and talking with us. I was actually gonna say the same thing. I just respected the bejesus out of the fugue. I'm a musician. And I thought that was so cool when the second voice was introduced. But I was wondering when, I don't know if this is something a film composer does or if this is something you work with like music editors on, how do you make those decisions about when you are going to score music and when you're going to include mothership connection stuff and Bach and anybody else that you include? Yeah, that's so that um, is a conversation that happens really early on with the director. And um, so we'll just sit, it's called a spotting session. So we just sit down, watch the whole movie through. And um, and I'm just taking notes and we're talking about, I, th I think music's going to enter here. And it, it, it can get really detailed um, d down to the point of like when she turns and gives this look, we want to we want to really accentuate that. And then we should be feeling fear after that. It's so I kind of come away from the spotting session with with a huge roadmap of of notes from the director. And then I have to figure out how to translate those. Um, but but during the spotting session, um, that's often when conversations about I think so this there's just going to be music that's playing in this bar or in this house here. And um, at that point also, they will have done a rough cut of the movie and have, have cut in some what, what they would call temp music. And sometimes that's various score snippets. Sometimes it is the, the what, what you would call a needle drop, the, you know, the song that they'll have in these locations. So yeah, that, that usually is by the time we're talking about where the music is going, that's usually pretty much figured out. Is it ever in the script at all? Does Ryan um, ever write it in? If it, if you put it in the script, that's a way to pay way more for it because then the people licensing it read it in the script and they know, uh, now we can get I you. I see. <laughs> I see. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but sometimes some people do write it in that early. Um, I, th I also think that's a way to set yourself up for huge disappointment uh, when you realize, oh, we can't get that song. So, yeah. I I'm curious, when the themes come to you, the, the motifs for the characters or... Where does that happen? Are you in front of a keyboard or are you walking down your a path? Yeah, some the sometimes the great question, sometimes both. Um for this one they yeah, mostly would come to me at at a keyboard. I have like 300 voice memos in my phone for when I did Nightmare Alley, I I came up with one of the main themes in the Whole Foods parking lot while my wife was inside and I was just wandering around like a crazy person singing into my phone. <laughs> so that I wouldn't forget it. But yeah, it's it's kind of, it, it, it very much, at that early stage, it's like wherever it comes from, and it's very rough and very sketchy. And um, yeah, that it's, it's it, uh, it often starts as the, um, as the dumbest little seed of an idea. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. The film is out on Friday. Tell your friends about it. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks so coming. much for coming out. Thanks, Ashton. Absolutely.